Music Industry Podcast, and I'm David Andrew Let's dig in. Today, I'm chatting with founder of Nashville for Hire, Andrew Galecki. How are you today, Andrew? I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm fantastic. It's going to be a great talking to you today. Yeah, I'm excited. So your online tool allows people to purchase remote music sessions and songwriters from Nashville. Nashville only singers, musicians, songwriters, producers, and engineers. Tell us more about that. Yeah. Um, so Nashville for Hire is basically the, the quickest way to, to narrow down is that it, it, in a way it's an online studio for people. Uh, it allows people who who might be in... Um, in, in areas of the world that don't have access to to great quality musicians, um, and you might still want to have something that sounds like it could be on the radio or that you can just be proud of when you put it up online. So we allow people to basically tap into the Nashville talent pool, which people fly from all over the world and 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 try to network to try to be inside of it and on an actual physical location. But uh, most people just can't get out here. So it allows anyone uh, to be able to hire out, whether uh, it just be, you know, one single banjo track that they want to add to their already almost complete song, or you can um, hire a producer to, 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 to hire their own people in town and then uh, record an entire song or album here and then layer on your vocals uh, from wherever you'd like to remotely. So uh, we, we act basically as a connecting tool. Um, and our goal is to be able to have uh, people walk away with uh, the best recording project they've done yet. Um, and it's exciting to be able to see uh, see that uh, be done. And um, we just are, are wrapping up a project. We were helping a, a girl in Australia with, and she goes to a music school out there, and you would think she'd have people to hire, but nobody knows the American country sound there that can work on her album. So she uh, is doing an EP uh, song by song with us. And uh, it's fun getting to, to hear it come together uh, and check in on it uh, and see what our producers are doing. Cause you, uh, cause I just know that it wouldn't be available otherwise. And these people get to have something that is, you know, kind of priceless for, for where they're coming from um, and just the resources previously available. So that's uh, that's the, the long and short of it. Yeah, I guess that's something that's not necessarily top of mind for everyone because from where I live, country is kind of a big deal. So there's plenty of country players out there and yeah. the Calgary Stampede and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not a country guitarist, but even I picked up a little bit to play a few gigs. So Yep, yep. Yeah. And, and it's, uh, Nashville has, you know, has labeled itself as a, as a country town, rightfully so for a long time. But, um, especially as there's been a big influx, it, it really is just pretty synonymous with music city in general. And so, um, the other goal on a, on a, on a different scale for the site is to be able to help expand Nashville from being just a genre piece of, you know, staple of country to, uh, reflecting what it really is, which is an increasingly diverse music scene. Um, and so, um, that's part of the reason I like living here versus some of the other, uh, American, you know, cities like LA or New York, um, is one it's it's a little bit the cost of living isn't as bad even though it's definitely going up as it grows um as those cities um but it's also just a smaller pool that's in its growing phase and uh it's kind of fun to be a part of that as compared to trying to break into something that's already you know going on and and just hoping you can climb someone else's ladder so um you know that's the fun part is being able to create a website like this because it, because there's a wide open landscape of of growth available um, with the great influx of of talent here and and constantly streaming in. It's definitely one of those cities I need to visit. I haven't been there yet. You know, people sometimes check out the quality of my content and then say, "I assumed you were in Nashville." So oh yeah yeah yeah. So nobody expects I'm in in, in Calgary and in, in Canada of all places. But well, that's the the great thing about I guess. Uh, you know, the whole online thing is that you can be producing amazing things from anywhere and, you know, be able to benefit financially from that. You don't necessarily have to live in a hub anymore. There's definitely, there's benefits of networking and all that, but, um, that's kind of a cool thing with technology is that you can do it 
at a high level from, from all types of places. You know, it's funny you say that because I was just thinking about that today. I was like, I spent the better part of three, four or five years networking. And part of that goal was just to get out of my shell and to yeah. talking to more people. And, you know, gradually it was like one person a day to three people a day. And then I worked my way up to five people a day plus. Yeah, I only made a few friends through that experience. Not a whole yeah. lot, <laughs> but at least I could say that I did it. And then I kind of really mm-hmm. re-recognized the importance of actually sitting at my desk and doing work again. And yeah. There's some people who do so well at the networking thing and make great connections and open up new career opportunities that way. And that wasn't me. I mean, I, yeah. I feel I can connect with just about anybody now, but it, that's not where things led for me with that whole networking thing. And I even spent time in network marketing. So yeah, yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird game. I'm kind of switching. I think it's, I, I think it has to be a give and take over time. Like you're saying, cause I'm, I'm kind of re switching back into, uh, I mean, I guess a networking phase, but it, it goes deeper than just my, than just my business endeavors and all that. Like it's, I've, I've realized I've been in like the buckle down, you know, musician, entrepreneur, like practice, you know, whether it be the practicing for five hours a day kind of narrative, or it's the entrepreneur slaving away on their laptop until 3am, you know, idea. Although I've been in that phase for a long time and it's been great. And I've, I'm emerging with a better sense of, of myself and what I'm capable of and with new skill sets, but I need to now start like collaborating those skill sets in a way that like can multiply them beyond my own, um, you know, uh, typing abilities and, you know, what I can do at home. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time trying to be self-sufficient, uh, as a musician and as a entrepreneur. And now I'm realizing there's, I've got to swing the pendulum the other way a little bit. I like that because so often we can become sort of a one man army, right? Just take mm-hmm. on the world, do it all ourselves. I've had people even suggest that to me. It's like, you should be the one making a crap ton of music, publishing it, making a ton of money off of it, doing sync licensing and placements, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And I'll go, you know, that is an option for me. It's not like I haven't thought about it. And I think it's something I'll maybe tackle in the future. But right now I sort of have my focus, you know, yeah, building right. this website and writing these books and creating these eBooks and courses. So getting too far distracted from that just means like I got to pull longer days and sacrifice sleep and sacrifice social life and a whole other, yeah. bunch of other things that I don't necessarily agree with or don't want to do. Cause I know that's the culture out there, right? With Gary, yeah, Gary, yeah. Gary Vaynerchuk and stuff like that. Work yep. 14, 15, 16 hour days. I mean, you got to be willing to do that, but you don't have to do that if you're focusing on the right things. If you 80, 20, your activity. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, I've, I listened to Gary's stuff and I'm, I'm listening through one of his books right now and I have to remind myself that and and he talks about in his latest book like he's when he speaks about like the most exaggerated not exaggerated the most extreme uh time slots of you know dedicating to work i think he's mostly using that as a buffer one to express what he's doing because he has like ambitions beyond most people and that's fine but i don't i don't want to you know own a, uh, a i don't want to be a billionaire and own sports teams um for my quality of life but he also i think is more he's trying to be practical and give like and be like, if you feel like you can't do this and you have some natural obstacles against you, but you work your butt off this much, things will happen. You don't know exactly what, but like if you apply your self-awareness and then you apply all that work, something will happen. And so I have to remind myself that I already work a lot and that that's not necessarily being pointed at me because I'll, I have a tendency to get really stressed out after listening to him because I'll be like, I need to get back. I need to get back to work. Enough dinner, enough eating. Just, just get back to work. So it doesn't tend to, to the other end of the spectrum. It doesn't lend uh, a lot of room for relationships, which he talks a lot about too, as far as whether it be networking or other. So I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to kind of dive back into, uh, people land. And even in my music, I've, I, I, I kind of was coming, cutting my teeth when YouTube and like the, you know, self-sufficient artists were like creating covers and like making enough money to survive off of from that. And so that was my 
goal for a while because that seemed like the most feasible option like and most interesting um but now that i've gotten to a point where i i can like at least create versions of my music basically all in house um with almost with next to no you know outsourcing i've now i'm realizing if i have the funds there's also time you know there's a, there's there's a reason to do it with other other people as well uh and uh that's kind of what I, I hope like Nashville for Hire can be as a resource where people who are, there's lots of people out there who are learning to do it them themselves, but maybe uh, they can dabble in like what it's like to collaborate even from afar and just, you know, hire out that mandolin track or some strings and stuff like that, um, that, uh, that help, uh, you know, kind of exponentially change your music and make it something that isn't just uh, the product of your own brain and, and skill set. Yeah, I feel that pressure too sometimes and I think it's mostly self-inflicted, right? You just kind of get yeah. to that point where you're like, "Oh man, I should really push myself to do more." And right. you know, supper is wasted time and bathroom right. bathroom is wasted time, <laughs> driving is wasted time. Yep. <laughs> and you you sort of start counting the hours going, "I need to accomplish more." But that's like yeah. a, it's a productivity mindset, right? It's not an if effectiveness mindset, which is a no. completely different thing. So, yeah, and our whole society is based around like the industrial age when we turned everything into uh into kind of workflow mechanics when we were able to start having assembly lines and figuring out the most productive ways and i think we're gonna on a relational personal level we have to question that to certain levels and then on a even a production level you know if we talk you know economies uh you know there's an idea that the, the if we have a technology we should use it um and if we if we can automate an entire factory, then we should because it'll help the bottom line. But uh, obviously, you can only do that so much until if half the country doesn't have jobs anymore uh, or half of any country, then all of a sudden the big companies can't sell things anyways because they, they still need to sell it to someone. So uh, I think there'll be a self-correcting, uh, hopefully sooner than later, where we, where, where we start to reevaluate. Uh, what productivity means as far as not just being the most like bottom line efficient Um, because there has to be that middle ground. Exactly. And there are, you know, opposing perspectives out there now, such as my business coach, James Franco, who I had on the podcast in episode 86. So it's good to hear, you know, differing perspectives on, on the whole thing of productivity and long work days and things like that. Yeah. I'd love, I'll have to check out that episode because if he's addressing that stuff, it sounds interesting. Oh, yeah. It was a great episode. There's so much gold in there. So getting back to the whole thing of session musicians, I think yeah. today you could probably go online, search for one of your favorite players and approach them with the idea of doing some tracking for your project. Whether they choose to work with you is another matter, but I'm guessing one of the value propositions you're talking about is the ability to streamline that whole process and quickly yeah. find quality session players is that a good way of looking at it yeah totally there's a few different you know we're not the only site in the space we're the only one with the nashville niche um but as far as you know marketplace style uh plus nashville but there's a few other marketplace style music production sites and of course there's just good old you know instagram to reach out to players um but the busier people get the the less likely they are to be responsive. So if you, if it's one of your favorite players who isn't one of your friends, there's going to be some, you know, some red tape to get through in order to get to them. And also, yeah, it's just a matter of, it makes it easier for the the people selling it because it's a system that they become more acquainted with and they're more responsive. And then as a, a customer, yeah, it's um, our pitching point as compared to some of the other sites in this space is that we curate our, our roster. So we're only pulling on people that we trust to do a good job and that we think are, are good enough to be on the site. And so, um, you don't have to fish through like a million reviews. And I think everyone in this day and age is getting a little bit tired of like seeing reviews and there, there'll be like the most excited review in the world. And then there'll be this one star and like, can't eat buy on, you can't anything basic on Amazon, like is impossible to buy because <laughs> it has, it'll have, you know, a hundred great reviews and then two one stars that are like, well, that's a good point. I guess I'll just keep looking for those, uh, that toilet paper I was trying to buy online. Uh, so it's, 
Yeah. Well, that is so true. Yeah, you you can really easily second guess yourself, and you hear. Yeah. Maybe you hear it from somebody that you trust, like a business coach or whatever, and you go, "I should buy this product." And then you look at the reviews and go, "Well, you know, it's got like a seventy or eighty percent rating. Should I really get it?" You know. (laughs) Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and and fortunately, or I found that like my quickest purchases come from the people I trust. So, cause I'll know, I'll at least trust it'll do what it need, what I need it to do, whatever it might be. And so we're trying to be that resource. And of course it takes time and, and, um, and, and us proving it to each customer that we are that valuable and, and different ways of doing that. But hopefully we can become that place so people can go on and not have to feel like they have to spend hours deciding the basic things and they can just know that it's really a matter of preference, not a matter of question of quality is kind of the big, uh, the big transition we're trying to have. That's awesome. And I'm sure this is something that's on everyone's mind right now. Isn't it expensive to hire quality Nashville session players for your project? It can be. Um, it depends on, uh, it really just depends on which one, uh, there's going to be different tiers that as you're looking through, you're going to find, um, uh, just different costs, but I mean, we, we it, it really depends on who you're hiring because there's a lot of really talented Nashville musicians who are not who are not world famous, um, and so you're not gonna they're not. There's a few people that have big ticket, you know, prices, and then if you really want to hire uh, Jason Aldean's drummer and and you're the biggest fan of him, like that's that'll that particular one might cost more than some of the others but if you're you know some of them you can hire a drummer for i think anywhere in the a lot of them are in the hundred range for per track hundred dollars and um you know if you need a bass player you know we have bass players from like fifty dollars up so it's really not i've seen especially comparing to other platforms that are that are not even like don't have the notoriety as far as of uh you know esteemed players people charge uh pretty wide range and so you you, that range is reflected um on the nashville side and then if you want to if you have the ability to spend some extra money then there's there's room to uh to kind of hire up and 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 find those people that are just you know the dream team um and then you can make that a reality if you want but if you're if you're on a budget there's there's a there's a whole range of of prices because we don't make the prices they do uh the people who sell do so um they want to be competitive to each other in a sense as well because if you want to get hired you can't be the only guy that's charging like a thousand dollars for a bass track so uh um yeah so really just uh it it, you know it it does cost money but it doesn't cost anything outrageous to get um to get the basics done i think you've made a good case for your services but if you were just to summarize what would you say as being the biggest advantage of working with nashville session musicians um, I think the biggest advantage is it's really peace of mind in in the process of knowing that you can trust uh, your music, which for me is the scariest part of collaborating. Trust it with someone else who is going to one have the experience and two um, have the uh, dedication uh, and profession professional mindset to be able to take it from where it is to where you're, where you want it to be. So I know I'm always terrified when I start working with someone, even if I like their previous work, that it's going to go south or they just might kind of miss it. Um, and so, and we even give a uh, a money back guarantee on our for the first order that someone makes through the site uh, that the Nashville for Hire covers, not the sellers, because. Uh, we, their time is valuable, but, uh, um, we do that so that way people can have peace of mind and, and kind of step into it knowing that they'll, they'll get what they want. So, um, that's, uh, I think that's the biggest benefit. Yeah. I mean, isn't that a big deal, especially when you're used to working at a certain speed, like as a musician and even as an entrepreneur, there's so much hermiting that can happen and you're in your closet doing the work. And then you sort of have to trust other people to yeah. understand it and be passionate about it and hopefully work at a speed that's acceptable to you. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes yeah. you have to, you know, be more realistic and just say, okay, they're not they're not gonna be as invested as me in this. But how, right. how can I get them to the point where it's the quality and efficiency that I'm looking for? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and uh and so that's that's something we make sure to guarantee so that just that peace of mind. Um 
I know that's that would be my biggest fear, uh, especially because it's a new medium for for people. I think it'll become um, not just Nashville for hire, but I think this will be a thing that's done more and more, and it's kind of a, a commonplace thing. Um, and so uh, I think people will become comfortable with the idea of creating with people online because um, I see it in Nashville as well, even in a, a music city, so to speak. Uh, we people do this all the time. They've been doing it for years. It used to be mostly you you do tracking at a studio back when that was kind of the way everything was done, and then you do overdubs remotely, and more and more people would have little overdub rigs where they could layer down some more guitar tracks and not waste everybody's time. Um, and so that was done, and now uh, even more you get people doing stuff from home for, uh, for in town projects. So if it's being done here where, where you have arguably more studios than most places, um, then I'm, I'm sure it'll be done, uh, on a, on a widespread area. So it's, uh, the biggest thing that people will be nervous about will be not being in the room with someone. And honestly, I think down the line, it'll become easier because, uh, uh, with like virtual reality and stuff, I once the technology is there and it's a household item, uh, it'll be a no-brainer that that a company like us and other ones will pick that up and integrate it, so you can still be in the room uh, with people in like a simulated studio space while they're tracking for your song. And I don't, I don't, that that doesn't take many more steps than whatever basic templates will be out there for VR in a few years. Um, so um, I think eventually it'll that problem will disappear uh even as people get more and more comfortable with it i like it now i'm going to transition into a different set of questions to kind of help out our fellow music entrepreneurs or music preneurs out there yeah bring it on all right so the first question i have for you is how do you market your business and what channels have you found to be the most beneficial for it so far i've uh explored facebook as a primary point um basically i you know as as a lot of people i'm sure in the audience will understand i was working off a very limited budget and so um I was the, the first goal was just to create the site and and figure out the how to do that within a, a budget that was very limited and so that took a took a while and uh, it, because it wasn't just me it wasn't just you know, create a, a square Squarespace template that you fill in and then it's done it was you needed you know sellers and I needed to get them to agree and need them to submit information and all that and figure out workflow and optimize it. So all that took a while and, and that was great. So the last few months I've really been, this has been when I've been diving into the marketing side. And so I'm starting more in the Facebook uh, world. And um, one of the podcasts that's great, because obviously people listen to this, listen to podcasts and you've probably listened to it. And I'm trying actually, I'm totally blanking on the name. It's uh, fa- I think it's Facebook Oh, marketing. I'll have to look it up while I'm talking. Uh, it's one of the main uh, Facebook marketing uh, podcasts, and I'll, I'll look it up as I'm talking. But um, I, I basically was like, all right, I just need to see myself as like a Facebook marketer. Oh, The Art of Paid Traffic um, is a great resource for people who are trying to figure out the landscape of Facebook advertising. Um and uh, that's one I've listened to a lot. I, and I, I was like, if I'm going to be spending money and time on this, I want to do it as, as right as I can. And I also uh, just want to kind of see myself as a marketer for the next few months and uh, pretend like I'm hiring myself, basically. And, and what would I do as an amateur marketer? So um, uh, a lot of that uh, Facebook ads are have a lot of layers but one of the the coolest things that have been coming out have been the ability to uh like clone audiences and um which basically means i can i can run an ad and make it very targeted to people or you know maybe i target at people at who like guitar center and um i have the ad be a very specific um target that I'm trying to hit that is very specific wording. It's not vague. So anyone who clicks on it are, are truly interested in what I'm trying to give them. Um, I then, once I get a certain amount of clicks, I can then, um, have Facebook analyze all that data of the type of people who clicked on that. And then I can have Facebook, um, recreate an audience with people who all fit into those same confines of what, uh, uh, that initial batch clicked on. So you're basically cloning, um, that audience onto new potential customers. And then I can market to that 
audience. So I might take an audience that was 150 people that clicked and then I can have, you know, millions of people that are fitting the same profile types as those people that I can then market to. Um, so it's as a marketer, it's great. As a consumer, it's kind of a creepy thing that it can be done. Um, but uh, and Facebook is dealing with their their own adventures um, on many data fronts right now. But uh, the uh, this type of thing, I'm, I, I imagine, will stick around. So, so tools like that and getting acquainted with the different ways that you can use that is super helpful. And um, I've been basically just doing a lot of um, email opt-ins. So my my strategy, I'm finding that is much more useful is. Uh, find a specific piece of your business that you can advertise and not just like the whole thing. So I don't run ads anymore that just say Nashville for hire, you know, allows you to hire Nashville's best musicians, check it out and hope that people click on it. Um, I would, if I was running a specific ad to, for, for services, I would say like need a guitarist or, you know, something, some kind of copy that's specific to guitar and I'd have it go right to our guitar page. And then I do the same for drums. Um, but right now, mostly I'm running, uh, specifically for, uh, some of our free giveaway guides. Um, one of those is on home recording and it's kind of the essentials of getting your home rig set up. And so I, it's an offering of a free PDF guide, um, that uh, goes through the the four main components you need for a home rig, and then it goes through. Uh, I, I interviewed uh, almost ten of our Nashville uh, producers and mixing engineers, um, and had them give like their go to list of like getting started stuff that they would tell a friend if they were trying to get started. Um, and, and so it wasn't like their dream list. It was like the practical list. So, um, people can download that, uh, for free through these ads and then you get them into the, the email marketing system. And then I'm currently building up that whole back end of the email marketing system, which is really where the work lies. Um, because it's all about giving a bunch more value and then, you know, occasionally chiming in and letting them know. Um, you know, pitching the site to them or, or whatever the service may be that you're trying to hit them with specifically. Um, so I, I do that for that one. I also have one uh, for sync. Uh, that is the same thing. It's a, uh, uh, the title's the number one thing, uh, keeping your songs from being synced and I, people can access and get the free download. And uh, I've been uh, pushing that and uh, getting decent click through rates Um as far as people uh, actually downloading it, who click on it. Um, and uh, that's been interesting. And then the other interesting thing that uh, is kind of all the the rage in the marketing space is uh, the whole Facebook chatbot features, um, which I'm not sure if you've explored at all. Um, but I've, j- yeah, I just literally started getting into it. But uh, the, and I'm just starting to kind of, figure out the next steps. I've, I've been able to, uh, run the same kind of ads. So I'm, I'm, I'm running the same kind of email opt-in ads, but it's for Facebook messenger opt-ins. And for anyone who's listening, who hasn't, doesn't know what that is. Um, it's basically if, if you're on Facebook, you have your messages, you know, portal and, uh, you can shoot messages to friends and stuff. Um, but the, uh, the way they that Facebook is set up now, there's a few third party um, services that you can basically treat as a business. You can treat your messaging portal as a almost email marketing tool. And so um, if a customer opts in to be a part of your messaging and subscribes um, by responding to one of your messages, you then can reach out to them in the future and, and continue that conversation. And so, um, it's a, it's a way that right now is seeing a lot better results as far as cheaper opt-in rates because it's so convenient. And then it's also email marketing in general. Usually you're getting like a, a 12% to 25% on average opening rate. Um, and that's a big number. I'm sure it is different on both sides. But um, for Facebook marketing, from what I've seen, and I'll be testing this for myself soon. It's usually closer to like an 80 to 90% opening rate um, and much higher click-through rates as well. So um, I'm just exploring that. And I, it's such a wild west in that like it, it depends so much on, on terms of use and it could change at any moment. But for right now, I'm getting a lot 
cheaper opt-ins. And so just to get people acclimated and familiar with my, my content, um, I'm testing that out for pretty cheap right now and, and at least seeing good success on cheap opt-in rates to get people signed up. So those have been um, kind of my focus for the last couple of months. That's awesome. I think the listeners are going to find a lot of value in that. I know I'm, I'm going to be listening back to this, uh, taking some notes. Oh, well, well, good. And, and and definitely check out that other podcast then too, because they'll be able to dive even deeper than I, than I can. Excellent. What is the biggest challenge of selling to musicians, producers, engineers, and how would you say you've overcome it? That's a good question. I think for Nashville for Hire, the, the challenge is going to be, um, I think it's that trust factor uh, of, of, of trusting you with your music over this, you know, this area, just this cyberspace of, you know, who knows who's on the other end. And so one of the ways I'm trying to overcome that is, um, when I started Nashville for Hire, I really had no desire. I was kind of burnt out on trying to like create a personality brand. Cause I have a podcast as well. And like, it's a lot of time thinking about myself and so I was like I'm just gonna have this business be its own image and whatever and then as I'm as I'm growing through it I think I'm realizing that the value of having a face connected with a brand is just uh is really a trust thing and a relational thing and so my goal is for there to be many faces of Nashville for Hire especially with the fact that we have so many sellers and then we'll have, you know, customer service reps and everything as, as we go on. And so, um, I, I, my hope is not for me to be the exclusive face, but for right now, when it's at this startup phase, um, I'm really trying to now dive into creating, um, creating some facial recognition with the brand. So that way when people trust me, they then can trust the company and get, and get over some of that, the, the creepiness of hiring out and, you know, basically placing your dream songs in the hands of strangers across the internet. Um, and, and we're in an age where like Airbnb exists now and there's kind of this backlash against the isolationist, you know, movements of, you know, build bigger fences and don't, don't open the doors and, you know, stranger danger at its highest, you know, degree. Um, you know, from, I think we went from at least in American culture from like the 50, 50s of, down and we kind of spiraled into this place of like distrust and now with Lyft and Uber and all these things it's kind of this reacclimating to like not just assuming your neighbor is going to stab you if you turn your back um and so I think in the same way that's what what we're doing is we're providing a service that you that there has to be that trust um whether it be you know a copyright trust you know trusting people with your material or trusting people with your your passion um but um I think putting my face with it and then as we grow, putting more faces, um, more branded, you know, people and more, more trustworthy people on attached to the site. I think that's how it will be overcome. Um, and I'm, I'm seeing it a little bit in that, that when I give, when I'm doing this marketing now where I'm just giving value and really not asking anything, you see people then asking for more information and, and kind of trusting you as a source. Uh, whereas if you were just coming out and saying, I am a great source of information for this, use our service. Uh, you know, nobody's going to believe that right on face value. So, um, that's, I, th I think that would probably be, probably be the answer to that one. Mm, yeah. I mean, guilty until proven innocent, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's the approach we're seeing these days, but yeah, yeah I think you're still right. You know, there's a lot of fly by night companies that make big promises and then some musicians buy in. I think it's fewer and fewer. I think they're getting smarter yeah. now and they realize, you know, there's no, there's no panacea. There's no cure all. There's no silver bullet. Right. <laughs> the way to succeed is, is through hard work and dedication right. to your craft and learning to market some of the yep. things that we talk about on this show. So it's good to see that, that people are, are beginning to realize that, you know, I'm not fly by night. The podcast started in 2009. Um, yeah. Not this are one, you my first podcast. Yeah. <laughs> my yes. first podcast, but yeah. Kudos to you. No, oh, thanks. So yeah, I'm, I'm, this is a passion for me and I'm trying to provide genuine values. So hopefully, you know, that boosts the credibility that I have over time. Yeah. 
And I think I think putting your uh, doing a podcast like you're doing it's a similar format to the one I've done. You get to place your name and your brand with these these trustworthy names of musicians or whatever it be, and uh, it automatically is going to boost your your credibility because you're you're getting affiliated with these high quality and and trustworthy people. Yeah, that's huge. So, what would you say are some of the biggest struggles you've encountered as an entrepreneur? On one end, I'm, I've been fortunate enough to have a pretty good uh, ego development throughout my life. I had two parents that were very supportive of myself, and uh, I I had enough uh, wisdom put inside of me to know that you don't just come off like you f- are confident, because <laughs> then you're an asshole. But I can also uh, I I I have. I have enough inside of me that I, that that I can be productive. Basically, it's enough to make it so that way. If I have an idea, I think, well, I could probably do that if I if I put my energy to it. Um, and so that allows me to push through a lot of the you know dark night of the soul moments um, where I you you're not sure what to do. But I think. Yeah, I think part of the isolationist ideas of like put your head down and grind, which is important. Everybody has to have their time where they really, you know, hone their craft before they go out and, you know, try to put it in front of everyone. Um, I think what um, I think the problem with that sometimes is that that you you can have different voices in your head that just decide one day that you should stop because it's not as successful as you think it should be at that point and therefore it must be an embarrassingly like bad idea that like everyone thinks you should stop except for you and you just didn't realize it um and i had that for writing um uh, music for for music licensing and sync i'd done it for about 2 years um with a company here in town where i'd just been adding to my catalog and keeping my head down and just trying to hone that skill and uh, I just wasn't seeing anything from it. And I would have moments where I'd just, you know, feel... I w- it's funny because I've, I've listened to podcasts and read lots of great books throughout the process. So I could label the moment. Most of the time I could be like, oh, this is one of those moments where the people talk about it was really bad. And then things keep going and a lot of times it gets better. And, and so I could hear that. But then there were certain sneakier voices at times that would like get through that narrative and somehow I wouldn't label them. And I, you just end up sitting there feeling, feeling lousy. So, um, I think being self-aware enough and like, um, giving yourself enough like grace to go through, uh, the entrepreneurial journey where, where it really, it's like, if you're being self-aware and putting your energy, you know, you talk about the 80, 20 and all that, putting your energy in the right places, then trusting that something will come out of that, whether or not it is what you picture or whether or not it is a true quote unquote success. Um, if you're putting in like high quality work into things, you will move from, from some kind of a to maybe B, maybe E or G, you know, you don't know, but you'll go somewhere. And so trusting that it'll be okay and trusting yourself to be, uh, creative enough to, to create solutions out of whatever letter you end up after a, um, is what's allowed me to kind of get through it. But there are definitely moments where I've, I felt like kind of an uh, unromantic sadness about like, well, this isn't where I want it yet. And so instead of seeing it as like, oh, this is my moment to push through. Sometimes you see it as this monotonous thing and you're like, I'm just being an idiot. Why don't I just go do something normal? Um, so, um, yeah, so keeping an eye out for, for those tricky, you know, self-doubt moments that can mask themselves as, as, uh, common sense or as, you know, something like that. Those ones can be a little harder to find. I can relate to that a lot, you know, and it's a bit cheesy, but focus stands for follow one course until success. Right. I'm just realizing the importance of that recently in my yeah. work and I'm like there's so many things I could be doing there's dozens of projects that I would love to get started even now but I recognize the importance of sticking with this it's not about not changing the approach because I think that's silly you know you try things expecting different results yeah and you keep doing the same things you're not going to get anywhere so it is necessary to change your approach sometimes to get to where you want to go but keep following that course and that's the freedom you'll then have the freedom that allows you to engage in those other projects you've always wanted to do 
Yeah. And that's where the, the learning, you know, comes from failure or, or success is when you've had tunnel vision long enough to get into the, the deep, you know, the deep parts of it. Uh, cause otherwise, you know, I could create like 40 websites this week with different ideas that would all get to the same level where I'm at now with Nashville for hire within like a month. Um, because I've, you know, cause I have a formula for that now, but like to get it to the point of, you know, major profitability and like all cylinders running and having a team, like I'd have no idea. I'd just have a bunch of clones of the same success level or lack thereof of my ventures I've done before. And so, um, I think the, the focusing is where you get to actually create something that is worth, uh, with worth creating again, if you want to keep creating different things. Um, and so, uh, you don't get there unless you really focus and, uh, it's so easy. I get, I, I definitely get, um, I definitely am a victim of getting distracted and thinking like, well, I'm not getting the traction I want this week on Nashville for hire. I had that one other idea. Why don't I go create a website and a logo and do this? And, and then, uh, a month later I'm like, all right, I haven't touched the other website in, in a month and I just created a clone of it that is at the same point as the other one. And now, now I want to find a new distraction. So, um, yeah, that can be, that can be really tricky. Oh yeah. I mean, that is so true. And I struggle with the same things and our journeys, you know, have certain parallels in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah. On the flip side, what are some of the biggest victories you've experienced as an entrepreneur? I think on the sync, because I kind of correlate them as far as like, you know, doing just doing work and putting your head down and thinking a little outside the box on the music and sync front. Um, this last year I've had, had about a little over a year, I've had a handful of, of, of good, uh, 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 rewards basically for, for the hard work as far as sync goes. And so I've had, um, some commercials, I've got my music on, um, some TV shows. And, uh, like two weeks ago, I, I was, had one of my songs at the end of a uh, Grey's Anatomy, uh, episode, which was really exciting. And so stuff like that, that are helping boost my brand. And then also I'm able to live off of, of that, that stuff right now, um, has been huge. And, and that came from like the, you know, the, the hustle of, of putting your head down and not stopping because I thought maybe it's embarrassing that it's been like as long as it has, and I don't have, you know, anything new to tell friends when I say that I'm working on songs for, for, for TV and film and sync and all that. So, um, that's been one, I think on the, on the business side, it's been, um, with Nashville for hire, just, I mean, one of the the best feelings was after finally getting the site up and then getting the, the first order to come in where it feels like it's a real thing was, was awesome. Uh, cause it goes from being this theoretical thing for so long, to being something that someone went through the process to, to make a purchase. Um, which like I said, there are very reasonable prices on there, but, it, but it's, it's not a $20 like, you know, watch accessory. Like it's, it's a purchase someone has to make and, and think about. So the fact that someone did all that and still made the purchase was, um, was a great, great feeling. Um, and then some of the, you know, just little, a lot of it has been like little successes along the way of like diving into the marketing and finding marketing copy that is working enough to just kind of automate the ads and still keep seeing email opt-ins come in, you know, while you're sleeping and stuff like that, that at first, like you make your first Facebook ad. And for me, it would just be like, nothing would happen. And you'd be like, I'm paying, like, why aren't these these imaginary things off in the distance, you know, not clicking on my links. And then you realize it's humans that are on the other end and they, they don't just do things because you, you put words in the air. So, uh, to get things to a point where they're actually working, um, like that and where you can spend money and get results was like huge. And that was uh, very uplifting for my spirits as I was going through it. Yeah, I so get what you mean because some days you wake up and you're like, how old am I again? And how long have I been at this? Right. <laughs> Shouldn't I yeah. be further along? Yeah. Right. I don't have the best answers. I did record uh, in episode 85, Overcoming Entrepreneurial Insecurity. 
kind of oh, did, cool. did my best to sum up how I try to approach that and how I try to look at things when it comes to like comparing myself to others, which is, yeah. you know, I once wrote comparison is the root of all unhappiness. So, oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that kind of hits it. Yeah, there's not much more you can do. It's I mean, if gratitude is like the key to 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 contentment, then uh then the comparison is the key the other end of that that just makes you feel miserable regardless of your circumstances. Great perspective. Now Oh, good question. Um actually, let me see if I have this. I think I wrote down I cuz I've kind of acquired almost like my textbooks that have helped be like my biggest guides. And I'm curious, I did, I wrote it down. Um, so let's see on a business side, ones that are kind of becoming my, uh, go-tos that, that I end up carrying around in my bag all the time, which makes for a heavy bag. Cause I'm always afraid I'm going to need to like reference something. Um, and uh, these have started to kind of all, they all overlap. It's kind of like uh, in, a, in a way how like most world religions have like a certain deep mystical level that all, you know, overact, overlap with each other. Um, most of the major ones in the same way, like a lot of these, these kind of signature books out there all have their cores that overlap and then they fill in these different useful gaps. So um, speaking of Gary Vaynerchuk, one of the ones that helped with social media and really just for marketing in general was Jab, Jab, Right Hook, uh, or Jab, 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 Right Hook, one of those. Um, that one's super helpful in just understanding the philosophy behind, uh, marketing on a social media level, but also email and really just anything. Um, it's the whole idea of like giving content over and over again, and then you make a sale. So you don't give until you've established that trust and, uh, the reciprocity effect effect where they want to, they've been given something. So they want to be able to give back. Um, that one I read a few years back, but that one's huge. Um, and then, um, another one that's come out is story brand, um, that's a Nashville based company and they deal with, um, marketing as well, but their whole thing is, um, uh, they were started by a guy named Don Miller, who is a, uh, who's kind of like a, a novelist, not a novelist. A mem- yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yeah. He, he went, um, into Chris created a company here in Nashville and, uh, he had been like a memoir, uh, writer. And then, uh, his most recent book was, was kind of chronicling the, the core tenets of the story brand company and the, the company's ideas. And they have a podcast as well, as well. That's a great introduction. If you're for people who are curious and that's just, I think it's story brand. If you type that in, it'll come up. It's got like a green backdrop and a picture of Don's face. Um, and so, um, their whole thing is basically learning how to how to explain your website in the most concise but clear way and not getting your own way of 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 making sales so um they teach companies how to do that and their book is basically on how do you um one express your ideas in the most clear concise way and then two how do you invite your customers into um actually it's kind of how do you invite yourself into their story so you're telling their story and and positioning yourself as a guide within that instead of saying check out our cool business that you know we've done this this and this and you should be a part of our great story that's already going because most people see themselves as the hero of a story not as someone to just be added on um so they kind of their big like paradigm shift that, that i was that's been the most helpful to me is that um you position yourself as the guide, not as the hero of the story you're telling your, um, your clients or your customers. Um, so that book is, is really great. And it's kind of like a textbook. It's just like a, it it goes through marketing at the end too. And like, it's a great place to, to start. Um, and then, um, I, there's another one copy that sells that's going to be, and I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the author, um, but that one dives into, um, just writing good, uh, copy and sales copy and, and how to write that for, whether it be for, for emails or for Facebook or whatever. It's kind of, a, again, a textbook on that. Um, we also, yeah, yeah, that, that one, again, it's just always in my bag ready to be referenced. Um, and then I just finished up and I'm implementing it 
within my email marketing. Um, but launch is a classic that, um, that probably a lot of people have already checked out, but that one is just all about creating a launch cycle for products or for ideas or whatever. And so I'm in the middle of, of implementing that as we speak. So I'll have more to, to be able to add to that in the future. But, but for right now it's, um, it's a trustworthy source because I, I, it's worked for bajillions of people. I'm just at the beginning stages. So those are kind of like my big four on the business front. Um, and then um, I'm trying to think if there's any others that uh, stick out. I've read uh, kind of a range of, of different fields. But on the business front, those are those are kind of my go-tos that I would recommend to anyone getting going. That's awesome. And I was just going to say, you know, the Donald Miller connection was I interviewed Steve Taylor, and Steve Taylor worked on the movie Blue Like Jazz, which is based yeah, on yeah. Donald Miller's book, of course. And that's such a weird and interesting book about spirituality and just yeah. life and disappointments almost. But yeah. it's, it's cool to see that, you know, Don has since moved on and, and made big things of himself in a way in the business world. So yeah, he's, he's had a cool journey. I followed I grew up kind of in the, in, in the bubble that he grew up in. And so there's a few different authors in that space that have all kind of like moved into, it's had an interesting evolution, um, that subculture. And so, um, his, his part of it is cool. Uh, and I really, uh, enjoy, I've enjoyed, I've always enjoyed his content as a writer and then now as a writer still, but, uh, you know, as a, as a CEO or whatever he is position wise, there's a founder of that company. And, uh, yeah, the podcast is great and they do a good job of pulling on different guests and getting good information out of them. So, uh, if nothing else, it's worth checking out for the people who are already obviously listening to podcasts. That's great. And I shan't keep you too much longer, but here's an opportunity to geek out a little bit. So what tools and apps are you using to run your business? Ooh, um, let's see. I'm, I'm in this transition phase of, of because I'm a musician and there's a umpteen million things that go into running that as a business. And then because I have Nashville for hire and then my podcast and a couple like side ideas that are, that are partially existing. Um, I just, I would just go through cycles of like obsessing over one, everything else gets neglected. So I've just recently started using, and I can't do a full review on it yet, but so far I like it, an app called Timely, T-I-M-E-L-Y. That's basically a scheduling app that, um, that I just basic I can block in my week and it's not necessarily tied to times of the day. It's just chunks and hours of different things you need to get done in that day. And as you do them, you can use it as a self timer to make sure, you know, clock in and clock out to make sure you're getting exactly the amount of time um, each day that you need to. And the big thing for me is that I then can block out my entire week instead of just blocking out my day. So I can know if I follow this set week um, and, and do everything on it. By the end of the week, I'll have moved all of my endeavors forward and nothing gets left behind, um, which has not been the case. And so uh, I'm excited to start imp implementing that. Um, I've been uh, traveling the last week, which threw off the normal schedule, but I'm excited to test it out um, and, and use that on a, on a more routine schedule. Um, and then trying to think of, I use, I kind of bounce around. I, I use everything as far as apps go from like, I also use some Evernote stuff to store more long-term ideas. I use, I have a Mac, so, and Apple products. So I use the notes thing for like my, um, for it's been, I've used that up until now for my day-to-day -day scheduling, but that's where I was running into the problem of like not mapping out on a broad enough spectrum where I was actually including everything. And, uh, my issue was I would, I would create a great to-do list for a day and I'd have categories and different types of things and certain things would be bold, others wouldn't in italics and it would be really great. And then I'd think, Oh, next month I need to like record this cover. So I'd be like, well, I don't want to forget that. So I'd add it in, but it wasn't actually for that day. It was just for the future. But if I didn't put it on that list, I'd forget about the other list and it would just disappear. So, uh, I'd end up having these to-do lists that would be like 300 items. Uh, and I'd just spend my days panicking cause I couldn't get through, you know, four of them. 
And uh, then I'd eventually like have to start another list just because I'd have something specific I'd have to do. And I'd end up just <laughs> abandoning the other lists and they just disappear into you know non-existence um, and get lost. So this, this new way is a way I'll probably use the notes app to just say, here's my long-term ideas. And then I'll have a check-in once a week on my schedule. It says check in with that app uh, and and implement what you need to get done next week from that. So uh, it gives me basically just peace of mind on a scheduling level and it's all self organized and self sustained. So if I don't do that, I'm finding things just always fall through the cracks. (laughs) I get what you mean. I actually used to spread myself out with Asana and Evernote Yep. And various other apps, Tick Tick and stuff like that, to where my task lists and ideas were all over the place. I think yeah. Evernote still has value as a long term idea saver. You know, I right. think it's great for that. But I've tried to force myself to just use Google Drive for most of yeah. that stuff now for my whole or- organization and life. So. Consolidate, but then I. Yeah, I'll have to go through the process of either moving a bunch of things from one space to another or or not. But uh, yeah, it's the curse again, the curse of like options and uh, of a- good advertising because you'll see an ad about organization, be like, oh wow, I'd love to be organized. <laughs> I'll download that one too. Yeah, I think every app sort of consumes a certain amount of headspace and energy, and you, you get to. Be- too many and all of a sudden you can't think anymore (laughs) yeah right you're just spread out and it's the worst kind of clutter because it like exists in a world that doesn't exist and so finding things within like a phone and a computer and four hard drives it just becomes a giant task to like find a picture that you knew you took last year but you have no idea where it could be all right cool is there anything else i should have asked not that i can think of um yeah, no, I think that's it. Well, it's been great talking to you, and perhaps we should catch up in six months or a year down the line, kind of get a sense of where you're at. But this has been fantastic, so thank you for your time and your generosity. Thanks for listening. Make sure to go to musicentrepreneurhq.com for show notes and other goodies, and leave us a review in iTunes to help us spread the word. 